this guy. This guy here is Dr. Emmett Brown. Um, I half expected uh, Alex earlier to be talking about uh, the invention of the flux capacitor in uh, 1955. Um, but he's, to, he's doing neuroscience, uh, which is what I'm going to be doing today. Uh, my name's Guy Smith Ferrier, and uh, I, I'm going to start with a small experiment. So, good morning, UX Brighton. Oh, that was brilliant. Excellent. Um, rule number one, don't badger the audience. But I did. I have a confession. Uh, my confession is that uh, I'm a developer, uh, which uh, there's kind of 310 odd people in the room here, and I think 309 are UX designers. I thought, okay, maybe this makes me the enemy here. But I'm going to be nice and kind and, and uh, a nice person and... I'll keep an eye on where the exits are in case it gets ugly. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to talk about this, this device here. This is an Emotive Epoch Neuro headset. Uh, I'm going to put this on my head, and it's going to read my brain waves. I, I need to start with a disclaimer here. I'm, I'm only talking about this device. There are other devices out there on the market. Uh, they, are, they vary in, in different ways. I'm only talking about this one device. So that we are clear here, uh, I do not work for Emotive. I do not own shares in Emotive. I do not sell products which are related to Emotive. I stand to gain nothing financially uh, associated with this product by giving this presentation. I'm talking about this because I heard that you could do this. And about two years ago, uh, I bought one of these devices. I thought, is, is this actually real? Can we, can we do this? I'm quite happy to believe that armed with a government-sized research budget, um, men in white lab coats and really big foreheads and no friends at all, I'm sure that those people can do this stuff. I have no problem with that. But can we go out and buy one of these for less than 1,000 US dollars and actually read our brainwaves? So I bought one about two years ago, and uh, I started using it, and... There are, there's stuff to see here, which I'm going to show you. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on my head, and you're going to see it working. Uh, then we're going to uh, use it to read my facial expressions, uh, which will be uh, somewhat challenging and, and lots of fun. Then I'm going to use it to um, show my emotions whilst wearing a headset. Now, this is the only demo that I can't do live. I can't do it live because... It's going to read my emotional state, and I am not some kind of Jedi mind master which allows me to control my emotions such that I can be happy, and then I can be sad, and then I can be happy, and then I can be sad, and happy, and sad, and happy. I can't do that. So I, that's my only canned demo. I'm going to show you something that I did uh, a while ago, and you can see my emotions changing under different contexts. Uh, and then it's going to read my conscious, deliberate thought which, personally, I find quite shocking. Um, and, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, let's start by... <laughs> yeah. Let's start by sticking this thing on. So... So that we're clear here, um, there's no surgical interference. I don't have any implants in my head. Uh, Let's just get to where we need to be. So, let's load this thing up. The thing that you are about to see here is the uh, emotive uh, control panel. Let's click OK here and log in as me. Let's move that up to the top there and switch this device on. Now, this is sending um, a... Effectively, it's a, a, a radio signal out to a little dongle that's stuck in the side of my computer here. And I'd really like some of these lights to turn. <laughs> See, that was my heartbeat test, where I go, oh my god, it doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's working a lot better now. Good. Um, so this is sending a, a signal uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz uh, range out to a little dongle uh, in the side here. There's an antenna, actually, sorry, on the right-hand side here, which is just sending the signal straight out. There's no wires connecting me to anything, frankly. Um, and you can see here that there are, um, hopefully the signal will, as I walk around, will stretch that far. Um, 
you can see there are green lights uh, on this representation of, of my head. Uh, if, if you have any background in neuroscience or, or uh, brain-computer interfaces, um, you may be aware that these things which are scattered around my head, and there are 16 different sensors here, are not actually scattered. This is not like a, a random, let's get the best kind of coverage kind of thing. Um, these sensors which are on my head are placed at known locations. So for example, although you cannot see it right now, on the back of my head here, on the left hand side, I have an O1 sensor, that's an O2. That's uh, just here, that's a T7, that's a T8. So these ones at the back are doing my occipital lobe, the ones on the side here doing my temporal lobe, uh, that's a P, P7, P8, that's parietal lobe, AF, AF3, AF4, that's frontal lobe. So they are uh, reading my brain waves from specific parts of the brain, and that's important. If you look at other devices, you can see there are, for example, other devices are, uh, out there which are a hairband. The hairband across, across the top here, which have four sensors in it, that would give you enough um, range to read parietal lobe and temporal lobe. But you would be missing occipital lobe, you would be missing uh, frontal lobe. Now that's important because the different parts of your brain are giving out different kinds of information. My occipital lobe and your occipital lobe is uh, registering visual input. So when I look at something, you would be expecting to see signals coming out of your occipital lobe here. Okay, so uh, let's... Let's move across to reading my facial expressions. Now, for this, I do have a camera on my face. The camera on my face is purely for your benefit. This has got nothing to do with the emotive uh, headset. It's just so that you can see my face. The way it's going to read my facial expressions here, this is, uh, as you can clearly see, that's a picture of me. <laughs> this is uh, when I go home in the evening and there's no one else around. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, a, an avatar here. There is nothing which is actually looking at my face and reading what I am doing. This is all done by uh, EEG and EMG data, so uh, electroencephalograph and electromyograph data. And the myograph part is the bit which is going to be reading my face. As I, as I go to move my eyes and, and my mouth here, um, so there are brain waves which are, are being emitted and captured by this device here and represented on the screen. So, I should be able to affect um, this image of me. Now, in order to show that uh, I'm not cheating here, I'm going to actually bring up a picture of me on the screen at the same time. I realize that Halloween ended a few days ago, but uh, just but that is truly horrible. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, good. We're, we're going to go with that, I think. Okay, so we've got me on the right-hand side and me on the left-hand side, and what I'd like you to do is see what kind of synchronization can I get between actually me moving my face and the, uh, um, the avatar uh, following my expressions. So let's start with a smile, which is something that gen generally I can't do. When someone points a camera in my face and says smile, I smile, and then it's gone. Like half a second later, I do the smile, and then I, I can't smile on demand. So my smile is kind of like a, kind of a horrible smile. So, let's <laughs> so there we go. As I, as I smile, go on, smile. <laughs> yeah, there you go. As I smile, so you can see this thing smiles. Now, I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and snarl at this thing, and as I snarl, so I'm going to make the mannequin uh, snarl as well. So I go, uh, uh, see? So it's, it's clearly reading my, my snarl, and it's changing between the two. Um, this is the bit where I have no idea whether this is actually working or not, because I'm going to look left, okay? And as I look left, so this avatar is going to look left, and I can't see the screen at that point, so I have no idea whether it's working. So let's go, let's go look left. It worked? All right, let's try and look right. Did that work? No, that was a kind of, no, that didn't really work, no. Um, let's try eyebrows up. So this thing has a, a relative amount of success on, on reading my facial expressions here. You can see um, uh, there's a few graphs here which are showing different things like, as I blink, for example, watch the top line here as I blink.
you can see, oh, not then, it has a fairly accurate um, response to me blinking. It's, it's within about 0.2 of a second. It, it can register the fact that I have performed an action and it will represent it on the screen. So it's, it's a fairly short amount of time for, for registering what's going on there. So why is this particularly interesting? Let me just shut this one down for a moment and start up something else. Uh, I think we can say goodbye to the webcam. That's uh, really quite enough of that. Uh, let's start up another one. Da -da. Uh. Okay, so here's another version of the same thing, which does something slightly different. And it's going to start up any moment now. There we go. Uh, let's log on here. Uh, same kind of thing as, you, as we saw a moment ago, except this is me during the daytime. Uh, strong jawline, very handsome. <clears throat> so let's, uh, I'm going to start up Word here. Any moment now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to control this. I'll bump up the font a bit so we can see a, a bit more. Yeah, there we go. Um, I can attach actions to when it recognizes a smile or a frown or a blink, I can attach an action. So if I take, uh, here we can see send specific keystrokes, and beneath that I, I've got send hotkeys, like a, a control key or, or an alt key, and beneath that I've got send a mouse click. So I could attach this to a, a full blink would be left mouse down. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say whenever I smile, pump a full colon and a uh, close parentheses into the keyboard buffer. OK, so what I'll do here is I will try and smile. Yeah, OK, that didn't work. <laughs> hey! <laughs> OK. All right, so let's do the, the hard part of the demo here is where I add in another action. I try desperately not to smile whilst I'm doing this because it will pump into the keyboard buffer. No, stop it, stop it, stop it. Don't make me laugh. Don't make me laugh. No, no, don't make me do it. OK, let's go back here. Now, the idea here is I should, don't smile. I should frown or I should snarl. Go on. Ah, ah, ah. And then I should smile. No, no, no. My smile, I should tell you, my smiles look like I'm frowning. <laughs> OK, so you can see here there is, I can register actions based upon my facial expressions. Why is that? I'm going to turn this off here, which frankly, this is the hardest part of the demo, is turning it off whilst using it, because it stuffs keyboard, uh, stuffs keystrokes in. <laughs> don't make me laugh. Don't make me laugh. Ah, there we go. Um, so why do we care about this? This actually is really quite important. There are, yeah, I did it. Thank goodness for that. Um, so there are two markets this is aimed at. This is aimed at the gaming market, um, and, and that's the primary thrust from uh, Emotive. Actually, for me, I don't find that the most useful thing for this device. Um, for me, this is, would be much better aimed at the disability market. So, and, and specifically in this particular case, uh, people with locked-in syndrome. So with locked-in syndrome, you are um, physically immobilized. Uh, two types of locked-in syndrome here. Uh, there is total locked-in syndrome, which is where you are completely immobilized. That's actually fairly rare. Uh, locked-in syndrome usually refers to the majority of your body, but you are left with the use of your facial muscles. That's typically the last thing to go. And even if you've got uh, the loss of your, your mouth muscles, the very last thing to go is uh, the full control of your eyes. So you could at least look left, look right, blink, raise your eyebrows. You still at least have control over that. So you could, by this is an incredibly primitive demo. There are much more sophisticated programs out there, but this allows me to show cause and effect uh, extremely clearly. You could control a computer using this uh, approach. OK, so let's move on to um, the next part here. I'll shut this down. And uh, we'll just take that off for a second and give me a bit of a break. That doesn't really hurt, but I don't really like things on my head. Let's move on to the next bit. So the next bit uh, here, I, I'm going to subject to you here. <laughs> it's 
So I am subjecting you to um, my choice of music. This is a slow blues by Patrick Smet, um, and I, I realize that I, I'm probably the only person that is really enjoying this right now, but I think this is quite cool. Um, it's a scientific experiment, though, so go with it for a moment here. What, I, what I've tried here is this, this thing's reading my emotional state whilst listening to this music. Now, I've tried doing this um, on stage before and changing my emotional state, and I can't do it. I can't do it at will. I tried it um, uh, playing games, listening to CDs, and there's a small fluctuation, but in this particular uh, video that I'm showing, in a moment you should be able to see a fairly large effect of different types of music. We're starting with a slow blues, I'm going to move on to another piece of music in a, in a moment here. So, to record this, what I did was I was at a live concert and I sat in this live concert with my laptop on my lap, with the headset on my head, and no one thought that was at all weird or odd in the slightest. People didn't point and stare and say, who is that? So, the, you are looking at various different lines on the screen there. There's a black line showing instantaneous excitement. Now, instantane there's a clue in the name there for instantaneous excitement, which is, it's instant. It happens, and then it's not exciting anymore. Um, you should see that the instantaneous excitement line is around about 0.4, 0.5, 0.6. It's a, it's a slow blues, and it's just come to the end, so that was the end of that. All right, let me show you the second piece of music. And from that, from that screen, I'm hoping that you will have noticed that most of the lines that you were looking at on the screen, even though I didn't explain all of them, they were around 0.4, 0.5. So let's pick up another one here. This one's slightly different. This one, when I start it up here, any second now. Right. This one is a fast boogie by a guy called uh, Big John Carter. Now, I like slow blues. I like fast boogie. I'm hoping what you can hear from this, this is a, a different piece of music. It's much faster. There's a lot of high notes on the piano, much more exciting piece of music. The, uh, so we're looking at the black line there, which is instantaneous excitement. We're also looking at the red line. Red line is engagement. So the higher it is, is how engaged in this activity am I? The lower it is, is how bored am I with what's going on here? There's a green line there, which is showing meditation. Now, I can't meditate. If you could meditate, you could move this line up to 0.9, 1.0. So if, if you're capable of doing that, you can affect this line. There are uh, videos on YouTube where you can see people doing this stuff. It's also your sleep state. So if you go into a deep sleep, you can see that this uh, green line raised quite, quite high. Also videos on vo uh, YouTube for that. The blue line is frustration. Frustration is the one that I don't get. I, this appears to bear no relationship to anything I do, so I'm going to just ignore the frustration bit. So, there's a couple of things I want you to see here. Look at the red line. The red line should be around about 0.8. And as this piece of music continues on, you'll see the red line getting higher and higher, 0.9, occasionally getting to 1.0. I find this piece of music very interesting and I am very engaged in what's going on, which is different to the previous piece of music, which was a slow blues, which is around about 0.5, 0.6. Also notice the black line at the top there. Throughout this piece of music, quite regularly, it peaks at 1.0. And you can equate that quite often to um, a particular riff that this guy is playing. Occasionally, you can't equate it to anything at all, because this is not an entirely scientific experiment. We're looking at these uh, different gauges here, and we're seeing an effect, and we're equating that to the piece of music that you can hear. But it's not wholly scientific, because you can't see what I can see. And you see the peak just up there? So that's what I could see at that moment, and then it drops down and falls away, and that's the point at which she left the room, and I couldn't see her anymore. Now, the thing about brainwaves, I realize that's politically incorrect. I, I understand that. But brainwaves don't lie. 
this is cutting through to the core here. If you want to do neuromarketing, plug one of these things onto someone's head, it tells you the truth and they cannot help it. Okay, so I think we're done there. Oh no, if I can just uh, wobble on for a couple more moments. There's something I want to show you here. See it peaking at 1.0? piece of music coming to an end here, okay? Coming to an end, coming to an end. Watch the levels here. Watch every single line, apart from the red line, dropping and plummeting. The music has come to an end. It's no longer instantaneously exciting, but the red line is like 0 0.8, 0 0.9. I'm very rewarded. I find this very interesting at this moment, and everything else has just hit rock bottom. So why do we care? Why is this interesting? It's interesting because if you are programming a game, for example, you may say, let's say you're, you're exploring some kind of a maze, and you're walking around the maze, and you get to a door, and you open the door, and behind the door, there's a great big monster. You would expect to see at that moment a huge spike in instantaneous excitement. That should be exciting, and if it's not, then there's something wrong with your game. You should also, there's another opportunity here for game designers, which is that red line showing engagement and frustration, if it's dropping down, then you could have your game react in real time. Say, okay, my, my uh, gamer here is not engaged in this game. We need to throw more monsters, more aliens, more spaceships at this person, but we need to up the tempo a bit because they're just not very interested. So I, I think that's a, a kind of an interesting way of plugging into people's subconscious without them really having a say in what's happening. <laughs> I probably should phrase that slightly differently. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's go back here then. Right, so we were at the control panel. Let's stick this back on my head for a moment. And let's wait for the lights to go green. The lights there are showing the, the different quality of connection on my head. The longer you wear this, the more those lights turn green. You can see the yellow ones flickering in and out. They'll, they'll eventually become green the, the longer this stays on my head, which really takes like a, a few moments, a couple of minutes. All right, so the next thing I want to look at here um, is something called the cognitive suite, where this thing can recognize your conscious action. So let's pick this thing over here, the cognitive suite. This thing can register when you attempt to perform a specific action. Now the way I've got, this is a, a, a sample demo program which um, is designed to allow you to manipulate a cube floating in space according to what you want to do. Now this is currently set up so that I can push this cube away from me or pull it towards me. I find this somewhat difficult. When I sit down at home in my study and I try to move this cube, I move it left, I move it right, I lift it up, I push it down, I rotate it, I make it disappear, I can fairly reliably do this. When I go to do this in front of 300 people, it's slightly different. I, I know from, so I've, I've been given presentations something like 20 odd years, and I know, whereas I don't get I don't get nervous. I haven't been nervous for a, a very long time. I am somewhat excited. I, I cannot, that's not something I can tune out, and, and it's not something I, I ever want to tune out. I, I enjoy this, but I do know that my, my mental state is different when I give a presentation to when I sit down in my office and there's nothing else around. So I'm going to try and move this cube, and we're going to see what happens here. Actually, maybe I should... Uh, Maybe I should uh, switch on the camera so that you can see what I'm, what I'm actually trying to do here. So brace yourselves for a moment here. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, so to perform these actions, you do not need to make any physical movement at all. I am going to, um, but I'm going to so that you know whether I am cheating or not. Let's move this across to the right-hand side. So I'm going to use... Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to use my hand here to push the cube away from me or pull it towards me. Okay. 
it is not related to your physical movement at all. It is all about what you're doing in your mind. But I, I'm going to do this so that um, it looks like, uh, so I'm not cheating. Now, I need to clear my mind, which is somewhat difficult. I can only push it at the moment. No, nope. I can only push it right now. Let me just change the parameters of this slightly. Uh, now I can pull it when I'm not trying. So let's uh, take out pull here. Um, I'm going to have a look at this difficulty level here. Currently it says easy. OK, let me add in uh, a few more things. I'm going to add the concept of uh, left. And as I do that, you can see the difficulty level changes to moderate. OK, let's take out push here. And I'm going to add in right. OK. <clears throat> now, again, I don't need to do anything physical for this, but I will just so that you can see what I'm trying to do. So. Wow, that's a rubbish demo. <laughs> OK, so I can move this cube from the left to the right reasonably at will. A couple of things I want you to notice there. <clears throat> Notice my skill rating here. This is the only thing where I needed to pre-prepare this. I have, previously, I've gone away and trained this. Now, you may look at this and think, 39%, that's my overall skill rating here. 39%, you're some sort of mind weakling here. <clears throat> I, I assure you, if you try to do this, 39% makes me a Jedi god of some sort. I worked... <laughs> for a very long time to get this up to 39%. And it is particularly difficult because um, here's, the, here's the training program. What you need to do to train this, um, everybody's brains are the same. So uh, assuming you are not impaired in some way, your brain has its occipital lobe in exactly the same place as my brain. My parietal lobe, uh, temporal lobe, they're all in the same space. However, your brain is much bigger than can fit inside your skull. So the way that that works is it gets folded in on itself. And the way it is folded in on itself is unique to you. It's like a fingerprint. It, it, nobody else's brain is quite the same way. So when it's reading uh, EMG data from your face, there is basically no training for that. It doesn't need to do that. When it's reading your emotional state, again, no training. But when it's reading conscious action, like trying to move a cube left, trying to move a cube right. You need to sit there and train it. The first thing you need to do here is record what your brain looks like when it's in its neutral state. So you clear your mind completely and think about nothing for eight seconds. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. <laughs> it is surprisingly difficult. It, it is really difficult. When you're going to sleep at night and you're thinking, I've got to go to sleep. So you'd say, think of nothing, think of nothing. Think of nothing. Did I put the cat out? <laughs> what about that bug in my code? Uh, did I take the kids to school? Uh, your brain doesn't think of nothing. It's always firing out new things. That's particularly difficult to do. And then you think of, then you train it again, and you think of the concept of left, and just left for eight seconds. Then what this emo engine does is um, it tries to make a distinction. When it's reading in all the different brain waves and everything, it tries to make a distinction between were you, was your brain in the what I recorded for neutral, or does it match the same patterns as for left? 
or does it match the same patterns as for write? There's a one second delay in that, and then it makes a decision, which one of these things were you doing? So people use this for different things. There is the, the actual conscious action. The way, the, way I would, the way I perceive this is, this is another controller. So we are very familiar with games which have a, a game pad, and we do this with our fingers and everything. This is another controller. So if you look at any device which has a remote control attached to it, so a joystick of some kind, that's what we would use this for. Take your joystick, throw the joystick away, put the Neuro headset on your head. So you can see examples of people doing this. So there are UFOs, which require a joystick, and other people have taken the joystick, thrown it away, put the Neuro headset on their head, and they control the UFO to move up, move down, left, right, forwards, back. They, mo they move a UFO. People have done this with skateboards, powered skateboards, which have a motor on the back, which frankly scares me somewhat. But and they move the skateboard left, or they move it right. People have done this with cars. So there is a project in Germany called Brain Driver, where some guy sits in the car, does not touch the steering wheel or the pedals, and they, with their mind, move the car left, move the car right, accelerate, which is the push action, and brake, which is the pull action. More realistic and, and incredibly useful uh, ways of, of using this device are robot arms. So there are people who are impaired in some way often have a robot arm by the side of their bed where they have drinks by the side of their bed or things that they need. They can move the robot arm out and then back again. Other people have connected this to a device called a RoboDance 5, which is a house robot. It's for people who need to do things around their house but cannot do it. And previously, they would do that with a joystick and a control panel. And now they don't need to do that. People have connected this up using a neuro headset, and they control their house robot, which goes around the house and does different things. OK, I am aware that it is 12.25, and I am currently stopping you from eating lunch, so I think that's a great point for me to stop. Um, you, you're going to come up and say, OK, I thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs>